Hi, I'm Jack Baker. I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors listed uh, on this slide on a project that we undertook to select CyberShake ground motions for engineering analysis. And uh, the, <clears throat> the motivation for this work is uh, we're interested in the increasing use of ground motion simulations in engineering practice. And you know, there's a variety of research efforts under, underway. And also um, we think it's important to have some projects to make the data accessible, uh, which is the more focus of this project. Additionally, with regard to the focus of this project, uh, I like to think about the following graphic uh, as a way to think about the role of ground motion simulations in engineering practice. And I think about uh, the following. So we, let's say we, we start with these seismic sources um, for a region and we're interested in the seismic hazard at a, at a particular location and ultimately the performance of a structure that's located uh, at that location. And um, as we go from seismic sources to perform seismic hazard analysis, we can use ground motion simulations to uh, quantify the distribution of ground shaking intensity that can be anticipated from any particular rupture at the location of interest. And through that seismic hazard analysis procedure, which can utilize ground motion simulations, we get to a target response spectrum. Um, and that target response spectrum is really the handoff in engineering analysis between the hazard characterization and the structural uh, performance assessment. And so in, it, as we take that target response spectrum as the loading that's specified for the structure, um, in some cases, we perform a response history analysis of the structure to understand its performance. So that involves selecting ground motions uh, as inputs to a dynamic structural response uh, assessment. So a couple notes here are that, um, you know, there is this, this handoff at the target response spectrum. It's, it's rare in engineering practice to go directly from a seismic source, simulate a ground motion and input that into a structure. We, we use that target response spectrum. Uh, additionally, the, you know, when we, when we do this, the, the amplitude of the ground motions is specified by the target response spectrum. We only need to find time series that are consistent with that amplitude and, and with the other characteristics we anticipate. And finally, we have a relatively small number of ground motions. So I have kind of in the lower right corner, a, a smaller number of ground motions there, typically on the order of a half dozen or a dozen ground motions in an engineering practice. And this project is really focused on that right side. If we start from the target response spectrum, we need a few ground motions uh, to input into a response history analysis of a structural model. So we took the perspective of an engineering consultant who would be working on one of these projects that re does response history analysis. So that, that response spectrum that was in the middle of the previous slide, that's going to be a site specific uh, calculation in, in most situations where we do response history analysis. So we can't pre-assume what that uh, response spectrum is going to look like. It's going to depend on the location of the project. It's going to depend on the site conditions and, and other factors. Further, the, the engineers who are um, you know, working on these types of projects, they're, they're probably familiar with the, the peer ground motion database, a database of several thousand recorded ground motions or, or other similar databases. Those usually have a graphical user interface, relatively simple way of getting at the, the ground motion data and, and a few thousand to tens of thousands of ground motions to choose from. You know, conversely, the CyberShake uh, ground motion database as, as developed um, for the hazard analysis purposes and for uh, other products has millions of time series and uh, has a more com complex, necessarily complex interface to uh, access those through, through database queries. And so, um, you know, we need to think about that from the engineering perspective or the consultant's perspective. Finally, these consultants were assumed they have some level of interest in simulated ground motions and believe that these CyberShake simulated ground motions could be suitable for engineering analysis, um, but they're gonna need some vetting to kind of narrow down the, the, that large catalog of ground motions into a smaller set that's suitable and some level of pre-screening and, and scrutiny of those um, so that they don't have to make the judgments themselves about suitable ground motions to use. And also if there's a, a peer review team, um, there's some you know, external validation of those ground motions that the peer review team could lead on uh, for their evaluations. So the approach we used in this project uh, is we, we wanted to consider several locations and site conditions, right? We can't pre-assume pre where, um, where those project would be or what site conditions it would have. Um, for all those conditions, we're gonna think, look at the ruptures of interest. So what earthquake ruptures are driving the seismic hazard at those locations. Uh, we'll look at the expected shaking in the form of response spectra that we expect from those ruptures. Then we'll search the cyber shake ground motion for, for comparable ground motions that would be suitable for engineering analysis. And then finally, uh, we subjected the results to review and produced a, a, a range of documentation. And I wanna walk through those steps in the next few minutes. Um, so for the study area, we looked at the populated areas near Los Angeles. Um, so the, the rectangle on this map below shows the CyberShake study area where the CyberShake uh, ground motion simulations are produced for. Um, the red triangles show the locations that we studied within that um, study area. So those are the, the most populated regions of the area where we would anticipate the engineering projects to be taking place. 
there was a total of 53 locations that we considered. For each of those locations um, and for each of a, a number of site conditions, we ultimately considered um, two site conditions characterized by VS30, uh, a softer and a stiffer site. We um, looked at disaggregations from hazard analysis and we looked at this MCER amplitude. So this is a design uh, level amplitude that the um, response history analysis would be performed at. Uh, we got target amplitudes from the US Geological Survey um, provided by the, the USGS co-authors on the paper. And we looked at those amplitudes at a range of from short periods to long periods uh, to, to cover kind of the, the range of frequencies that might be of interest in these engineering projects. And for each of these design amplitudes and each of these locations and each of these conditioning periods, we got a disaggregation uh, result. And the initial results look something like the table in the lower right here, where we have uh, a range of seismic sources um, that could be contributing. The percent contribution, the, the relative likelihood that they, that was the source that could produce the design level shaking at the site. And then the mean magnitude and distance um, associated with ruptures that could cause exceedance of that target amplitude. So for each location and, and period, uh, we get a, a set of result magnitudes and distances like this. And those are all plotted on this uh, figure uh, here. So we've got magnitudes on the vertical axis and the closest distances to the rupture on the horizontal axis. And so those are the, the con rupture conditions that we're interested in uh, for these locations and for ground motion amplitudes of engineering interest. So large magnitudes, you know, mostly magnitude seven to eight, small distances, you know, almost all less than 50 kilometers and many less than 20 or 10 kilometers. And if we compare that to recorded um, databases, we see a mismatch here. So in green, now I've super uh, had a superposition of the, the earthquakes that are earthquake ground motions uh, in the NGA West 2 database. So a large um, database frequently used by engineering consultants. And we see that there's not a, not a, you know, a relatively small fraction of this database is at those very large magnitude, small distance conditions um, that are of interest at these uh, locations in the Los Angeles area. And so that motivates this selection of cyber shake ground motions to supplement our recorded catalogs with, with more uh, ground motions in that rupture conditions. If we zoom in, so this is magnitudes and distances, the same thing as the, the previous plot, but zoomed into the, those conditions of interest. Um, so the, the dots still show the disaggregation data points. The black lines show contours of, of probability with a kind of a kernel smoothing just to see where the most likely cases are. And then we selected a smaller number of rupture scenarios, recognizing we don't have to match each one of these exactly. We just need some, some ground motions from comparable conditions. So we selected the four target scenarios shown with the heavy black circles. And the goal was to kind of focus on those largest magnitude, closest distance uh, ruptures um, that were important in disaggregation. So we don't need to worry about the, say, the magnitude six ruptures at the bottom of the plot very much. So there's plenty of recordings of those type. It's really going to be those magnitude seven and a half or eight uh, ruptures where we could benefit from supplementing the recorded catalog of ground motions. So we, we took those ruptures and then we searched the CyberShake database for matching ground motions. So the, uh, um, these boxes on the plot show the kind of magnitude distance boundaries that we looked at. And then we looked at a boundaries of plus or minus 20 meters per second on this VS30, the shear wave velocity that measures the, the stiffness of the soil at each location. Um, so that gave us an initial search there because the CyberShake database is a, is a massive database. There was several hundred thousand to several million ground motion time series available for each of these conditions. Um, so we needed to further narrow down the, um, the selection to a manageable number. And we used uh, what, what I call a target scenario process to do that. Um, so the idea is, is kind of moving from left to right here. We start with a target magnitude and a distance and a site condition. So the magnitude and distance come from those four scenarios on the previous slides. VS30, we looked at a 365 meter per second case and a 760 meter per second case. So a softer and a stiffer condition. And for those values and some um, assumptions about rupture mechanism and things like that that are typical in the area, we predict the mean and the standard deviation and the correlation coefficients for response spectral values at a range of periods. And, we, and those are from empirical ground motion models, which are the models typically used to, to build the design spectra. Um, and then from those, we sample a suite of spectra, just statistically sample response spectra that we would expect for those conditions. So that's illustrated in the middle figure um, in the green lines. So we generate a set of, of potential spectra. And then the blue spectrum is, is just one example out of the I think 40 on this plot. So that blue spectrum is a sampled, uh, statistically sampled spectrum we might expect from these rupture conditions. And then on the right figure, what we do is we take that blue spectrum and we compare it to all of the cyber shake spectra. So I wouldn't put, plot them all on this figure, but to illustrate there's a hundred or so candidate cyber shake ground motions response spectrum. And we, we select the black 
uh, response spectrum, which is the spectrum from the suite that's closest to that target blue spectrum. And so with this uh, strategy, if we do this for each of the sampled spectra in the middle figure, we can generate a set of, uh, or, or we can select a set of CyberShake ground motion time series that have response spectra that we anticipate being reasonable based on empirical ground motion models. And we can sample down to a smaller set of these uh, ground motions that, that kind of collectively represents the variability in, in spectral values we would anticipate. Uh, in the end, we selected two component ground motions from that CyberShake database. For each of the scenarios, the magnitude distance VS30 values, we selected 40 two component ground motions. So a total of 320 ground motion pairs because we had four scenarios, each paired with two site conditions. Uh, here are some plots of uh, say one of the sets of those. Uh, I, I think this is the full set of 320 actually. Um, so the left figure shows uh, 100 of the selected CyberShake ground motion response spectra in black, and then 100 NGA West 2 uh, database ground motions in green. And then the right figure shows um, the full suite of, uh, of ground motions for both sets of, of ground motions, the horizontal axis showing one second or 0.1 second spectral acceleration, the vertical axis showing five second spectral acceleration, so a very high frequency and a very low frequency metric of ground motion amplitude. And in both of those plots, you can see that the, the CyberShake ground motions are at the strong end of what we see in the NGA West 2 database. Um, but they're not outliers. They're not extremely above what we've seen in recorded catalogs. They're just at the strong end. And, and so we're, we're supplementing those high amplitude cases where we have limited recordings with additional time series that we believe to be relevant for engineering analysis. Uh, we subjected those, those selected ground motions to a range of review. I won't, I won't discuss that, but a number of people had the chance to look at all of our documentation and selection procedures and provide comments that helped us refine this process and, and reiterate it a few times. And then ultimately we produced a, a set of documentation. So I'll note the DOI at the top of the page here. So, so there's a data archive and documentation archive there. It includes uh, all of the time series. So we have the data, the actual time series files, as well as plots of acceleration, velocity, displacement. We have plots and data for response spectra for each ground motion. Then we have a, a large table with characteristics of the ground shaking intensity, like the durations of shaking, presence of velocity pulses, if there are any, things like that. And then also a, a range of characteristics for each, the ruptures that caused each of these ground motions, the, the, the name of the source, the magnitude of the earthquake, the distance away, and, and so forth. So that's all available at this DOI. Uh, additionally, um, we implemented these uh, this database into a open source ground motion selection software. The URL is, is noted here. This is kind of a reasonably popular tool among uh, engineering researchers in particular and some practitioners. Um, and it's util it can be used to select ground motions out of uh, recorded ground motion catalogs, but now it can also be used to search this database um, by just flipping a flag for which source of ground motions are, in are of interest. And so our hope here is that researchers could select uh, simulated and comparable recorded ground motions and use those for research studies of the um, suitability of these ground motions for engineering analysis. So to conclude, um, we selected a set of CyberShake ground motions to facilitate this engineering analysis. Taking the perspective of a consultant who might use these in a response history analysis, we aimed to provide a, a catalog of these high amplitude ground motions for the large magnitude, um, small distance ruptures that would be relevant in, in Los Angeles in particular, but, but maybe relevant more broadly around the world. Um, and part, one of the challenges here was to go from the many, many millions of CyberShake ground motions in that project down to a small set of several hundred. So we developed this procedure to kind of select a few important scenarios and then screen the remaining ground motions based on their uh, response spectral amplitudes. Then this whole process went through this review and, and, and the documentation of the data was really an important output of the project. Uh, and ultimately our hope is that we, these ground motions will be used in engineering analysis projects and, and they'll be more accessible uh, in this format uh, and with this initial scrutiny so that they, they can provide value to engineering consultants. And I think they'll also facilitate further research through things like this comparative studies of recorded and simulated ground motions that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, to conclude, I'll leave you with some, some references. So the, um, again, I'll repeat the, uh, the URL for the um, archive of the data. Uh, I'll note my website where there's some additional uh, resources related to these ground motions and, and uh, links to that ground motion selection software. And then finally, I'll note at the bottom, the reference for an earthquake spectra data paper that is in press um, that fully documents this procedure. So obviously skipped over some details of the, of the pr process, but that's more completely documented in this paper um, for those interested in more information. So with that, I'll close. Thank you very much for your attention.